When I lived in uh, Delaware, me and Sue's lived in Delaware and a family, uh, we were up there ministering, and we lived in a trailer. And uh, for some reason in this trailer, they had decided that they would put down carpet in nearly every room. In fact, they put down this dark blue carpet, and it went even into the bathrooms. Now, I'll admit that when you step out of the shower in the morning and onto a warm carpet, that's a lot nicer in some respects. But uh, the truth is it's very hard to keep all that carpet clean. It was kind of a nightmare. Uh, I remember one time we were uh, having friends over, and at that time we had a dog by the name of Flanagan, and he had the run of the place. And so we had, we had friends over, and we were enjoying each other, and all of a sudden we were overcome by this... Uh, terrible odor. So we went and searched out the source of this odor and we discovered that our dog had gotten sick in the bathroom. Now the problem was in the bathroom there was carpet. So we went to cleaning and we worked on it and in the process of cleaning we weren't getting it done. It still was a bit odoriferous and so we proceeded to stronger cleaning products and we scrubbed them into the carpet and we finally got that all cleaned up. It took us quite some time but but it looked pretty good and we went back and spent time with our guests. But by the next morning uh, what we didn't realize is that those carpet cleaning or those cleaning products had continued to work on the carpet and we walked in and all of a sudden there was this huge bleached out spot right in the middle of the bathroom floor. Now if you walked in your bathroom, you saw this huge bleached out spot in the carpet, you would probably think, well, I I need to fix this spot. And probably the smart thing to do would be to cut the carpet out of the bathroom and put down linoleum or, or put down some tile. But I decided I had a better solution. And so what I did, which I thought was the best thing at the time, is I just got a little bathroom rug and put it over the spot on the bathroom carpet. Sound like a good idea to me. We laid the bathroom rug over the bathroom carpet and it wasn't very long until we completely forgot about the bleached out spot on the floor in the bathroom. We didn't see it. It was out of mind, so in our minds it wasn't there. That worked pretty well until we decided that we were going to buy a different house, which meant selling our trailer. And it was at that moment that I finally realized that, hey, there's going to be people walking through our home, inspecting every inch of it, and they're going to see this huge bleached out spot on the carpet, and that might keep them, derail us from selling our home so we can move into another one. And I began to get a little panicky about the stain on the carpet. Today, I want us to look at a stain. It's not a stain on the carpet. It's a stain in the lives of mankind. It's a stain that affects every single one of us. Now, we have been going through a a series of sermons out of the book of Mark. So if you have your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 7. And uh, we've been going through this series. And and as we've gone through this series, we have... uh, been talking about all the things that Jesus did. Him as king. Uh, This series is really based on the book King's Cross by Timothy Keller. But right now we're looking at Jesus being king. Now when we get to Mark chapter 7, I want you to understand the religious leaders of the day are trying to take every possibility of, of discrediting and undermining Jesus and his authority. And so in this text, they're going to challenge him on the law. Now the problem is, they're really not challenging him on the law. What they're really challenging him on is the oral traditions that they added to the law. Now, I started to think, well, you know, those religious leaders, they're always trying to do something underhanded, something manipulative. And then I realized that this is also our tactic, isn't it? I mean, instead of honestly listening to each other, we we try to discredit one another. We try to convince others that there's this huge problem, and in doing so, we try to get our way. And that's exactly what the religious leaders were doing. Now, Jesus doesn't take this tactic 
lying down. He, he doesn't just let them run right over him. In fact, he kind of shines a light back into their lives, the same light he, they were trying to shine on him and his disciples. He shines back into their life, and in doing so, he reveals this huge stain in their life. Now, you'll see what I mean as we read this text. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come to the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the, tra to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? And he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. These religious leaders had convinced themselves that their traditions would save them. In fact, they thought everyone else should follow as they followed the traditions of the elder. But what they failed to realize is what we often fail to realize. And that is this, you can't hide the stain in your life. You just can't do it. It's an impossibility. You can't hide the stain. The truth is, these men thought they were righteous. In, in confronting Jesus earlier in the book of Mark about the company he kept, I want you to listen to Jesus' remarks to them. Mark chapter 2 Verse 17, they've confronted him. They said, why are you eating with sinners? And he says this, Mark 2, verse 17. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus' point is I have come to help those who need help. But I can only help those who realize they need help. These men thought they were right with God. They felt their traditions were enough to purify them. And so in their mind, the stain was gone. They were hiding it. They may not even realize they were hiding it, but they were using techniques to hide it that we still use today. They used the uh, cam camouflage technique. This is one of our favorite techniques to hide the stain of sin in our lives. This is when, instead of allowing God to examine our hearts and allowing other people to see with transparency who we really are, this is when we start deflecting attention from ourselves. And normally how we deflect that is we try to put it on others. That's what they did. Look at these disciples eating with unclean hands. Which in essence means, look at these disciples not keeping our traditions. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 3, there's this interesting passage. Just one verse long here. Here, It really speaks to me. It says, why do you look for the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? The disciples weren't breaking the law. But these self-righteous leaders felt that they could hide their faults by pointing at other people. Have you noticed that uh, we like to hide our own faults by pointing at other people? Have you noticed that we don't only just point at other people and their faults, but we make up faults for other people so that we can point at other people? Look at him sitting by her. I bet something is going on. We just make it up. doesn't matter if it's true or not. Make it up. Boy, they look tired this morning. I bet they've been out partying all night. 
Maybe they were out helping a friend. Maybe they were studying their lesson for this morning. Maybe they were sick all night and were struggling to get here. But we just make it up. We make up a fault so it doesn't look like we're that bad. We use terms like this. I heard. They told me. I'm sure that. And in all of those things, almost always, we just make up a fault and apply it to someone else. Because guess what? I don't look that bad anymore. So these religious leaders, they start by deflecting attention. But they also assume not only can they hide their stain, but they have assumed that they can somehow remedy their own stain. I, I like how the NIV puts it. It puts it in quotes, unclean hands, in quotes. Now, I like that because the, the point is this. It wasn't that they had unclean hands. But in the religious leaders' minds, they had unclean hands. And by extension, the religious leaders felt like they had what? Clean hands. If I say that you have unclean hands, then the assumption is I probably have clean hands. See, these men believe they could cure themselves. They've convinced themselves that they're good enough, that they've done enough to be clean. If you go over to Galatians chapter 3, Paul kind of refutes that. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. This is what he says. He says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. Paul makes it very clear. No amount of good things you can do can remove your stain. It will not save you. See, they had become self-deceived. They felt like if they gave the right amount to God, if they attended the right amount of worship, if they read the right amount of God's Word, if they kept the right amount of traditions, they were good. Does it sound familiar? See, it's so easy for us to fall into the trap of thinking we can hide our stain. The truth is not a single one of us can hide it. Not a single one of us can deal with it. Now Jesus goes on about the stain in Mark chapter 7. But I want to pick up verse 14 through 23. This is what he says. 14 through 23. It says, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me. Everyone and understand this. Nothing outside of man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he'd left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared, all food, foods clean. Isn't that a great thing? Yeah. All foods clean. So when I go home and eat some ice cream, still clean. I'm good. He goes on. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For, uh, excuse me, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of a man's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. He makes it very clear. The stain is on the inside. It emanates from the heart. Which leads me to the next thing we need to understand is you must use the cleaner. And there's only one. I didn't put cleaners. Cleaner. Jesus' point is you cannot handle it on your own. You have to come to Him. He's the only way. He's the only one who can clean away the sin. They convinced themselves that their problem was just skin deep. It was only what you did and not where all that came from. But the point that Jesus makes is that it goes much deeper than that. Don't we often think the same thing? We focus on the externals, what someone eats or what someone drinks or what someone reads or what someone listens to, what someone watches. And you know what? 
We don't, we're not even that worried sometimes about the content. We're just offended that it's different than us. Well, I can't believe they listen to that Christian rock music. What? We get upset because something isn't what we think it should be. I heard a story just this week about this kind of attitude. A, a church had a small group, and they were having this fellowship gathering at one of their homes. And because they wanted to reach out and, and try to bring people into the church, they invited a couple, this, this group, this couple, man and wife, who had just attended the church a few times. Uh, they'd only been there twice, two or three times, and so they invited them to come to their gathering. The problem was that this new unchurched couple didn't know all the unspoken Christian rules that we have. So when they came to this home, this gathering of Christians who were trying to reach out to them, they showed up with a gift. Now the problem was, the gift was a bottle of wine. Now the host of the gathering was caught off guard a little bit, didn't realize or know exactly what to do with this gift but after a moment they gained their composure and they said hey thank you for showing your appreciation and they graciously accepted the gift and set the gift aside <laughs> thoughtful pretty good way of dealing with something i think the problem arose however when others in the church began to hear about this gift that was brought to a small group gathering in the church and they became very upset that these non-christians would do such a thing they got very upset with the small group who would involve in their lives such people who would bring wine to a small group gathering. See, the problem was they were so caught up in what might, what it might look like to others, that they ignored the fact that these small group was trying to reach out to this couple and introduce them to Christ. They ignored the fact that this couple was experiencing fellowship and love. They ignored the fact that the love of Christ was being communicated by a group of people. Even in a very awkward situation, they just ignored it all. And judged only by what they saw. In Mark 2, verses 15 and 16, this is what prefaced the Mark 2, verse 17 that I read earlier, but it says, While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? I want you to understand, it is important what we choose to do. That's a truth. It is important. We need to do as many right things as we possibly can do. We need to watch our speech. We need to control our eyes. We need to refrain from acting in anger. But the real focus needs to be our heart. Because the truth is, if you change your heart, those other things kind of come along. Uh, they change with it. You remember after David had confronted, or was confronted, I should say, with his murder and his adultery that all stemmed, all resulted from, a lustful heart for Bathsheba. Remember what he says? It's found in Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. This is some of the greatest. I, I just love these passages. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. This is what he, he says. As soon as I get there. He says this. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. He knew he couldn't fix the stain. He knew he couldn't fix all the grief he had caused. He knew that his stain had hurt many and he knew that God was not pleased. But he also knew that God was the one and only. Who could, who could provide for him. He knew that God would cleanse him and renew his heart. He knew that God could free him from the stain of sin in his life. And so he goes to the one who can clean the soul. See, Jesus really calls us to bring him 
all of our stains. To recognize that we cannot do anything to remove them. And to accept His cleansing in our lives. It's a shame, but I, I believe that as Christians, we are far too often like these Pharisees. We, we far too often think we can do the right traditions or the right rituals and live right with God. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know, I'm better than most because, you know, I, I come more often to worship than most. You know, I saw some people, they don't come to Sunday school, but I come to worship and Sunday school. And then someone else says, well, you know, I saw them at worship in Sunday school, but they don't come to Sunday evening service, and I come to Sunday evening service. And then someone else says, well, you know, I also come to Wednesday night, small group. And so all of a sudden, it starts to be this comparison, and all of a sudden we think better of ourselves. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right with God. Just look at all the places I go. And then we think to ourselves, you know, when the offering plate goes by, I give more than 10%. We'd say to ourselves, I, I, you know, and I took an active role in teaching, and I took an active role in leading, and, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm better. I, I look the part, you know. I, I wear the proper clothes to service, so I'm right with God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, there's an interesting verse. I want to read it to you this morning. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, this verse really hits me right where I live because it says, in essence, God is saying, you think you're good enough? If you think you're righteous because of what you do, you're self-deceived, and there is no truth in you. You're fooling yourself. You can't hide that stain, my friend. But then 1 John chapter 1 Verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We have come today because all of us are stained and we cannot do a thing about it on our own. But we know the one who loves us so very much that He cleanses His heart with his, cleanses our heart with his very own blood. We pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you provide. And I am sorry for all the times that I've tried to hide the stain in my life, that I've attempted to act as if I could provide for it, that I could cover it up, that I could remove it. Lord, I pray not just for myself, but for each one here. I pray that we will recognize that you are the cleanser of our souls, that you are our only hope, that you are the one who make us righteous in your sight because we've been covered with Christ. We've been transformed by him. We've been sealed with your spirit. And with all those things happening in our lives, Lord, I pray that we will rejoice that the sin in our life is being removed and has been removed by you. Thank you, God, for all you provide. Thank you, God, for the great love that you show us, even when we, have, we don't deserve it a bit. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.